all of the presentation uh, from your computer. Hey, thank you, John, for that introduction. And it should, did you get the prompt? There we go, perfect. So can you can you see the uh, the PowerPoint? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's in Excellent. the okay, edit, gonna... edit mode right now. Yeah, I'll put it in full screen mode now, slideshow mode. Um, so let's see if that works. There we go. All right, so which view do you see? Do you see the kind of dashboard view or do you see the actual entire screen view? It's the presenter dashboard view. Okay, let me take my monitor off then. All right, see if that changes anything. Hold on one second, let's see. Sure. There, there we, we go. go. That should be full screen now, right? It looks good, thank you. Excellent, okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It truly is a pleasure to be presenting here today, and I just, you know, like to thank John, uh, John Hadley for setting this up, as well as the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council for requesting that we present this webinar here today. Uh, so my name is Wesley Merton, and I direct the Beyond Our Shores Foundation, as well as the Dolphin Fish Research Program, and uh, we're based here in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And since many of you don't know me, um, and you may be familiar with the, the history of the Dolphin Fish Research Program, or uh, my predecessor that ran, ran this before me, uh, Don Hammond, I figured it'd be uh, important to introduce myself a bit more. Uh, so I prepared a slide on just a little bit about my background. Um, so, you know, I was born and raised in uh, San Diego, uh, California, and halfway through high school, I moved to Rhode Island actually and finished up high school here, and then went on to get my bachelor's of science in marine biology from the University of New England in Southern, in Southern Maine. So I have some roots here in Southern New England. Um, from there, I went on to get my master's and PhD from the University of Puerto Rico uh, in Mayaguez, studying marine and fishery science uh, under the direction of, of Dr. Richard Appledorn. And uh, I defended my thesis in 2014, which was on dolphin fish. And then shortly thereafter, I began uh, fish aggregating device contract work with the government of Puerto Rico. And I managed five annual FAD grants uh, through to the end of 2019. Uh, during that time period, I also was a Canals Fellow in the Office of International Affairs and Seafood Inspection for NOAA Fisheries. So currently, in addition to managing the, the Beyond Our Shores Foundation and the Dolphin Fish Research Program, um, I'm an adjunct professor in the Department of Biology, Marine Biology, and Environmental Science at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island. Um, so I actually got involved in the Dolphin Fish Research Program in 2009, so I've been involved you know, more than a decade now. And I began as a, a volunteer data and GIS analyst for, for Don Hammond. Um, and since we have a, a pretty long history um, of this program, uh, in a second here, I'll show you a slide on kind of the history of the program to kind of just give you a better grasp of this research program and how we got here today. Uh, but what is the Dolphin Fish Research Program? Well, it's, it's an international citizen science mark and, recapture, mark and recapture program for dolphin fish. And, uh, you know, the idea is to uh, collect data on movements, life history patterns, and population dynamics of the common dolphin fish, uh, known scientifically as Coryphena hipparis. And it began in 2002, and we're now in our 19th year of, of research. Uh, so, um, you know, it's like I mentioned, it's a really neat history, and it's very re uh, relevant to briefly discuss the history here, so you better understand the program. So it actually started as a state-funded um, effort uh, based out of uh, Charleston, South Carolina um, back in 2002. And it was called the South Carolina Dolphin Tag and Study during that time. And it was widely successful. And during the first four years of the program from 2002 to 2005, um, it was able to generate over 100 recaptures um, from tagging activity along the Eastern Seaboard um, and from you know, about 5,000 tag deployments over that time period. Uh, and Don Hammond was a state employee for South Carolina Department of Natural Resources during that time. And he ran the program um, out of that agency in Charleston. And uh, when state funding ran out at the end of 2005, he ended up uh, actually retiring from SCDNR. And then he took the program uh, and created basically a private entity uh, to keep it running. And, and really, uh, he started that, that private effort 
based out of outcry from you know the participants from from the program over the first four years of the program. Uh, and then he renamed the program the Dolphin Tagging Project uh, and and continued to grow and expand uh, the, the tagging program. And then in 2008, that's when he renamed it the Dolphin Fish Research Program. Um, so that's how we we got our name, the Dolphin Fish Research Program. And the program has continued to grow and expand uh, through the years, all the way up until you know today. And uh, my involvement in terms of leadership uh, really began in 2017 when uh, Don approached me, uh, I think it was like February 2017, uh, he uh, called me up and he, uh, he said he was going to retire from directing the program and he asked me if I wanted to carry it forward at the end of 2017. And uh, I you know, thought it would be a, a pretty ambitious and, and uh, fun, uh, you know, intriguing uh, role to serve. So uh, I agreed and then I worked with him as well as a bunch of other key participants in the program to form a 501c3, the Beyond Our Shores Foundation, to carry the program forward after his retirement. Uh, but you know, there's been a lot of amazing milestones through the years for many different fishing vessels and, and fishing teams. You know, first satellite tag deployments, uh, boats reaching 2,000 tag deployments for their own team. Uh, so a lot of amazing uh, milestones and feats that have been uh, you know done during this tagging program and during the history. Uh, of uh, the program so far. Uh, so, you know, May 1st, 2017 is when we formed the Beyond Our Shores Foundation with the principal goal to expand uh, the dolphin fish research program. But given my research background uh, and research portfolio on fish aggregating devices, uh, I wanted to incorporate additional research programs into the overall portfolio for the Beyond Our Shores Foundation. Uh, so uh, given my background of doing some FAD research uh, in the U.S. Caribbean Sea, uh, we've incorporated uh, FAD research into our overall um, objective, as well as we ran a successful seafood traceability project based out of uh, a town known as Arecibo uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, collecting economic data uh, on dolphin fish uh, within seafood restaurants in that location. And it, it was a fairly successful um, pilot project. So these latter two programs, uh, to me, they offer you know, additional ways to collect fishery independent as well as fishery dependent data and economic data on dolphin fish. And you know, it's with members of the fishing community that otherwise wouldn't engage really in tagging, but they wanna help with data collection. Uh, so to me, these other two programs really augment our overall approach to collecting more data on dolphin fish which can lead to uh, increasing, uh, obviously, data collection to make more uh, rational management decisions uh, for the conservation of the species. And you know, given the large recreational component of the dolphin fish fishery, you know, a citizen science approach is really one way to institute both opportunistic and structured research initiatives to increase the amount of data collected on dolphin that can lead to rational management approaches. And the overarching goal for, for me as the director of this program is to ensure the long-term conservation of the species. And in the case of dolphin fish, it truly is an ideal citizen science species uh, for the following attributes. It's got a wide distribution, you know, it's fairly easy to catch, uh, low recreational expense to target, um, you know, depending on your run uh, to the fishing grounds. And, you know, it's very close to, to, co to the coastline and many comfortable marine settings. And it's a very popular fish. I mean, every year it uh, occurs on the cover of all the major fishing magazines. It's printed on multiple articles of clothing and all these different products. So because it's such a revered and iconic offshore game fish species, it truly makes it a model species to engage the public in collecting uh, biological and fishing activity data. And uh, early on in my studies as a fishery scientist, I, I, I kind of had this intuition regarding the species, and which is why I really started to volunteer with Don Hammond uh, back in you know, the early years of 2009 through 2010, uh, and then started to, to play a, a bigger role um, in helping him. Um, and uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, our sponsors and our supporters also recognize that, you know, the tagging of the species transcends multiple aspects of fishery science and fishery management. And thankfully, we've been uh, widely supported by many uh, companies and uh, groups through the years. 
So uh, the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, they've been our principal sponsor since um, 2016, February 2016. Uh, we've also been uh, thankful and lucky to, to be supported by Grady White Boats. Uh, AFCO, uh, Sirius XM Marine just came, bon came on board. Uh, Perry and Niblet PA came on board a couple years ago. Uh, Star Rod's been supporting us from the very beginning. And we also have state agency support. So South Carolina DNR helps uh, from year to year and also uh, the government of Puerto Rico and the government of uh, the US Virgin Islands. Um, and then, you know, our private donors uh, truly are responsible for keeping the program running year in and year out. And this year I'm happy to report that we've had 135 private donors and businesses and fishing clubs support our work. So uh, I'm working hard to, to grow data collection and grow our relationships with our sponsors and our donors uh, to help conserve uh, this species and, you know, offshore fishing for, for this amazing iconic uh, game fish. So presentation outline. So my objective here today is to provide a comprehensive update of data collected through the Dolphin Fish Research Program. So I've prepared a, a pretty ambitious talk with, with many slides, but I think we'll get through all of them. Uh, nonetheless, my, uh, my approach here is to present first our research objectives, both uh, back you know, when we first started and, and then now of what they've evolved to become. This will then get into our overall statistics and we'll first look at participation and then tag deployments by zone, which will then lead into uh, dolphin fish horizontal movements and pr uh, principally looking at uh, horizontal movement types. And I'd just like to, to mention that um, the figures and data products that I'll be using for basically the start of this uh, portion of the talk um, are currently in review um, and they've been in review for, for several months now for a manuscript that uh, we are working to publish, basically uh, providing a comprehensive review of the program since day one. Um, that will then lead into looking at U.S. East Coast supply routes. And I don't know if uh, those of you that follow the program received the newsletter today, but we just had a really cool, exciting recovery uh, just a few weeks ago. So we'll, we'll visit that. And then uh, I also prepared an analysis today um, on dolphin fish landings in the Caribbean Sea. Um, just a preliminary look at that. Um, also going to touch on our fish aggregating device research because it's extremely important given this topic uh, nowadays in the Caribbean Sea. And then we'll, we'll just uh, quickly kind of breeze through because I won't have much time towards the end on vertical movements, growth and population structure. Uh, but nonetheless, we've published research uh, on those topics. So we will touch on those and then uh, conclusion. And I will be using uh, the approach that Don Hammond took three years ago when he presented um, to the council. So I'll be using uh, a similar approach that he took and, and augmenting certain sections uh, today in this talk. And please feel free to, to stop me at any point and ask questions or send a chat or something. I, I think that that is completely doable. All right, research objectives. So let's get right into this. So this table basically outlines the original objectives set forth back in 2002 and uh, how they've evolved through the years. And before I unveil um, the rest of the table, I'd just like to mention some of the original objectives were you know, to identify spring and fall migration routes for dolphin along the East Coast, um, document the international range from the US East Coast, uh, identify recreational fishing grounds along the US East Coast, uh, define the relevance of sargassum. And really the, the principal thing about the original objectives was that they're all based on research along the US East Coast. And the, the evolution of these objectives are that we now view these within a regional context. And um, we're focused on data collection uh, within these five uh, regions, being the US East Coast, um, but focusing in on also the Mid-Atlantic Bight, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, and the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And I would just like to, to point out to you first that we do have some new objectives, um, given that our data set does have strengths and weaknesses. And one of those strengths is that you know, the majority of our mark and recapture movements and tag deployments have been in the Florida Straits. Uh, so there is uh, a full manuscript or multiple manuscripts that we could write on, um, you know, the dynamics of fine scale movements from Key West up to Canaveral. Uh, so, and then, you know, relating that to different oceanographic and, and remote sensing data products. Uh, so that's something that's definitely uh, something we wanna do um, and we will be doing. 
Um, and then, you know, weaknesses for our data set are participation in the Mid-Atlantic Bight and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we certainly have tried to create uh, award programs to get anglers to participate in those zones, uh, but by and large, it's been tough. Uh, nonetheless, the last three years, we have seen an uptick in participation in the Mid-Atlantic Bight, as well as the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we do have a regional awards program for the, the Mid-Atlantic Bite running right now. And, and to date, we've already had eight vessels tag fish off the Mid-Atlantic Bite. And I know that doesn't, doesn't sound like much, but that's a lot more than years previous. So, and then uh, moving over to the Caribbean Sea, um, given my research uh, history of studying fads off Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, um, I feel comfortable of including, uh, you know, a, a, an objective to really a zero in on um, fad research as it relates to dolphin. Um, so that's a new objective for me uh, in the program. And then with funding from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, we've expanded to uh, the southern uh, so the southern region of the Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean, essentially. And uh, we're, <clears throat> we're studying out of uh, Tropic Star Lodge uh, to uh, describe the movements and life history patterns within that part. Uh, of the world. Um, but the other thing I want to point out here with this table is that there are just a lot of unknowns surrounding uh, the ecology and the knowledge of the life history of the species uh, within the Western Central Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so, you know, my job is to try to collect data in these areas to uh, improve these data deficiencies so that we have a better grasp on uh, our knowledge of this, this amazing uh, iconic uh, fish species in our ocean. So uh, today I'm going to try to um, speak to how we're answering, we're trying to answer some of these unknowns and also augment um, these other uh, areas that we, we need to increase data collection in. So to do that, we have to uh, first visit with participation and, and look at how uh, we're trying to increase participation um, to uh, obviously co collect more data with uh, the fishing community to address our research objectives. So we have a pretty widespread, widespread angler network. Um, as of this past weekend, um, 1,623 captains aboard 1,642 vessels, uh, just shy of 5,000 participants and uh, you know from 25 countries and 43 states and now these are just hard counts of unique individual names obviously um, there's a lot of boats that just submit their name and not their crew um, and they've been tagging with us for you know 16 years or 12 years so the program has touched a lot more people than just uh, these counts but these are just hard counts of uh, our you know, folks that participate in this tagging program. Um, obviously, you could see by looking at the um, kind of the, the zip code raster uh, projected on the map, there's a, there's a high density of participation along you know, eastern Florida on up through Charleston into North Carolina uh, and along basically the entire eastern seaboard. Also, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, uh, quite a few anglers participate. Uh, but this is growing. And uh, I, I created this plot uh, a few years ago, so there are some additional areas that we could highlight uh, with new participation. Now, with citizen science, you know, there's kind of a facet of many citizen science research uh, projects in that you'll have a, you know, a small group of very dedicated individuals contribute a lot of the data collection. Um, and that is that's certainly true here. You see with this plot, uh, which is on your x-axis, you have number of individual taggers. On your y-axis, you have tag deployments. Um, so it's basically showing that we have, you know, a small group of very dedicated individuals that are tagging uh, hundreds of fish per year, or you know, 50 to 100 to 150 fish per year, um, which is really helping drive uh, recapture generation. Um, but we do have, you know, obviously um, hundreds of anglers that tag just, you know, one to five to ten fish per year, which is very valuable. But uh, my goal would be to try to, you know, uh, decrease this, uh, this kind of exponential decay, if you will, um, and try to get more anglers to tag anywhere from 20 to 50 fish per year, uh, which uh, is completely feasible given um, some of the landings we see uh, with different uh, recreational fishing teams. Now, in terms of uh, kind of like uh, the socioeconomic makeup of our of our participants, um, you know, the majority, about 70%, are recreational anglers that are highly experienced, uh, been, and they fish about 21 days or more per year. Um, this uh, these results are taken from an ongoing survey that we capture when we get tag kit requests. 
I think we've had about 550 survey responses. So I was pretty, um, I wasn't shocked, but you know, I, it was interesting to see that about 17.1% of participants actually identify as recreational, commercial, and charter. Um, so multi-sectoral anglers. Um, but we also have almost 3% that identify as just commercial anglers. And I know in Puerto Rico, there are a lot of artisanal commercial anglers that are extremely valuable in providing data uh, for the program. And then, you know, for the charter, um, I was surprised to see that only 10% of participants are charter boats. Um, obviously, charters depend on uh, dolphin fish uh, pretty substantially, especially if you're running charters from Key West up through Charleston or even the Outer Banks. Um, so I think this is an area that we have, uh, we can grow and, and uh, getting more charters to participate because uh, we are trying to uh, protect and conserve one of their primary uh, sources of income, which is having people catch dolphin uh, offshore. So a couple years ago, I had uh, an intern do a quick analysis of all offshore marine tagging programs just to kind of see where we fell uh, in terms of all these other uh, iconic programs. And we felt when you do a rank on releases based on subject species, we fell right in the middle. Um, so uh, kind of neat because, you know, anglers that do engage in this program can be proud to be engaging in, in a reputable tagging program. And I am certainly proud to be uh, running this tagging program. All right, so now let's move from participation into uh, tag deployments. And I thought it was necessary for you to kind of see that, that first uh, bucket of information regarding participation because it really will help us strategize how we can increase tag deployments in different parts of the world. So as of this past weekend, 28,209 fish have been tagged for the program. Um, and when you break this down by uh, tag deployments and fork length, you see about, you know, the, the, the peak is roughly around 18 to 20 inches is the, uh, the peak size that most anglers are tagging. However, uh, there's quite a few fish that are tagged above that, that 20 inch uh, dash that I indicated on this plot. And that 20 inch dash is the uh, minimum size within the South Atlantic Bight. Um, there are a lot of fishing teams that tag for the program that actually won't land uh, fish uh, less than 26 inches, less than 30 inches. Uh, they, really, uh, they really value uh, tagging those fish rather than landing them, given that they're, the fillet size uh, is not that large. Um, and to that end, there are multiple um, fishing teams that have voiced that they do support um, either an increase in minimum size uh, in certain locations of our region um, to say 24 inches uh, fork length. Um, and I've heard that from multiple different people. Um, so uh, that's just kind of an indication of our overall um, you know, distribution of, of tag deployments and tag deployments by fork length. Now for Florida, we have the majority of our mark and recapture data is generated within Florida, about 69.3% uh, since 2002 have, have these fish have been tagged from you know, Key West on up uh, to the Florida Georgia line. Um, and uh, the Keys represents, you know, about 56.1% of that. Uh, so 10,900 fish have been tagged in the Keys, uh, 7,500 from uh, Key Largo up to West Palm Beach, and then uh, the remaining 1,000 um, in uh, Northern Florida. So this also points to the fact that, you know, we, we could uh, obviously benefit from getting more participants in that Northern part of the state. Um, and it's, it's a pretty strategic location in terms of research because, you know, you, you, uh, the Gulf Stream exits the Straits and you know, just north of Little Bahama Bank, there could be some really interesting dynamics if you tag a lot of fish on each side of the stream to see um, the trajectories that they go and, and the amount of uh, time it takes for them to move along the eastern seaboard. Um, so those, th this basically depicts the Florida tag deployments. Looking at the South Atlantic Bight, 14.3% of our uh, mark and recapture data set in terms of releases was generated within the South Atlantic Bight. And uh, within Georgia, um, obviously given the run, um, it's, uh, we have less tag deployments um, because a lot of anglers have to run much further there. But off Charleston, South Carolina, due in part to obviously Don Hammond uh, pioneering the program there, We've had 2,700 fish tagged um, off that part of the South Atlantic Bight. 
Um, so pretty good amount of data generated off Charleston. Also Georgetown Hole, uh, other fishing areas such as Winya Scarp and Bubble Rock are big um, hotspots that these anglers uh, tag fish for us at. Moving up towards uh, the Outer Banks, um, only 538 fish tagged within this part of North Carolina. A lot of activity um, is uh, kind of focused around the point, um, a popular fishing spot um, just south of the lighthouse, um, uh, you know, off of uh, the Outer Banks, and uh, lots of recaptures occur there as well. Um, but, you know, once you turn the corner and head up towards Virginia Beach, um, the amount of tag deployments falls off uh, pretty rapidly. Um, only uh, through the past 19 years, 188 fish have been tagged in that part uh, of the uh, state of North Carolina. And we do have some new anglers that are providing, uh, you know, catch composition and, and different types of reports. Um, and we hope to get some more taggers uh, involved in this part uh, of the South Atlantic Bite. Moving up to the Mid-Atlantic Bite, um, we've had, you know, 1.3% of our tags deployed in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. So obviously uh, a weakness in our data set and potential, huge potential growth in terms of understanding uh, residency times within the Mid-Atlantic Bite and connectivity with places such as the Azores uh, and the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we've, had, we've not had any international dispersals um, recorded from the Mid-Atlantic Bite to the Caribbean Sea or to any other location um, within uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, also, you know, given if we do start to increase the amount of tag deployments here, we could get more recoveries on commercial boats in the Sargasso Sea, which could point to uh, interesting uh, patterns, uh, fishery dynamic patterns. So moving to the Bahamas, oh, I actually uh, skipped uh, too quick there. So when you break this down by the different parts of the Mid-Atlantic Bight, uh, you know, the area north of Delaware, um, so Wilmington Canyon, on up to um, south of uh, Phelps Bank are where most tags have been deployed um, for uh, this uh, location. Um, and south of Delaware towards Virginia Beach, you have just 115. Uh, but these canyons, uh, there's some really interesting dynamics um, of this fishery within these canyons. Um, I'm sure most of you saw uh, a couple weeks ago, another 74-pound 74, 74 fish was caught in Poor Man's Canyon. Um, that's a third over the last uh, 12 months within that very canyon. Um, and as far as I know, those are the largest fish being landed along the East Coast over the last uh, year. Um, so interesting uh, dynamics in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. The Bahamas. Uh, so we published a paper on uh, information collected within the Bahamas and within our data set, uh, it represents 4.6% uh, of all tag deployments. Um, so pretty good amount of participation occurring uh, within the Bahamas. Now the, the, the region that we've seen the most growth over the last several years is in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, this represents 8.4% of tag deployments and uh, we now have active taggers in Barbados, in Guadalupe, uh, Virgin Islands, around the Puerto Rico, uh, the Caymans, uh, Dr. Guy Harvey and the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation are, are helping from the Caymans. And we've just had some anglers start to participate in Isla Mujeres and uh, off of the Yucatan, uh, Mexico Yucatan. Uh, so a uh, huge amount of opportunities here in terms of data collection for the species. Now the Gulf of Mexico, again, uh, historically low participation, but as of late, we have had uh, Captain Bob Falinski, based out of Corpus Christi, start to tag 80 plus fish per year. And I think he won a star rod in Shimano Rio last year for us from the, for that effort. Uh, so pretty good deal there for starting to collect some data in the Gulf of Mexico. And then finally, Eastern Tropical Pacific Ocean, um, due in part to funding from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, we start to see an uptick in the amount of tags come out of uh, the EPO for us. Um, so we're up to 1.9% uh, um, for all tag deployments. So, so there it basically breaks down how our data looks in terms of releases within this part of the world. We have, we've shipped kits to Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean and people have tagged fish in South China Sea. So people take tags all over, but this is where we're generating uh, the most uh, amount of data. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna move to the horizontal movement segment. So three years ago, Don Hammond presented uh, this slide to this council. Um, at that point, uh, there were 551 recoveries generated and he broke these recoveries down by these uh, movement types. 
Um, now, as of this past weekend, we're up to 706 of recoveries, which is a pretty substantial increase in the amount of data generated uh, over the last 36 months. Um, now, these are the April 2017 counts that you see here, and we've formalized um, these, uh, these movement types or definitions that he was putting together into kind of a more um, uh, robust look at how these movement types break down. Um, now, I'm not gonna go through each one of these. Um, we do have examples for all these different movement type def uh, definitions. Uh, the, the, the key ones I wanna point out are the Florida in-state and the Florida short-term re revisits. Uh, so this represents about almost 49% of the recapture data set. Um, so 306 examples of Florida in-state movements um, Short-term revisits, we've got 37, and these are uh, fish that were tagged and recovered off Florida um, with a days at liberty of more than 60 days, pointing to possible, you know, mini migrations around the Bahamas or around Sal Bank or even, uh, you know, lingering uh, movements off of uh, the lower keys um, before they're recaptured again with, within Florida state waters. Another uh, strength within the recapture data set that I'll point out is the interstate movements. So 169 movements um, of fish between states along the East Coast it represents almost 24% of uh, the movement data set. So a lot of interesting uh, you know, pathways and, and movement speeds between these states uh, from that data set. And then, like I mentioned in the tag deployment segment, uh, we've seen an uptick in the amount of tags deployed, so obviously we're starting to see an uptick in recoveries uh, within the Caribbean Sea. Uh, so we're up to uh, you know just about six and six and a half percent um, uh, of the total recapture data set from uh, the U.S. tropical U.S. Um, tropical Atlantic and the U.S. Caribbean Sea uh, locations. And then I'll just highlight here areas that we can potentially see a, a big increase if we start to get more participation in, in the Mid-Atlantic Bite. Um, you know, with more participation, we'll start to see these numbers rise pretty rapidly, uh, given that, you know, dolphin is the second highest targeted um, offshore game fish species uh, behind bluefin tuna in this part of uh, the East Coast. And then uh, U.S. East Coast dispersal. So these are international movements. We got, uh, you know, 2.69% of the movement data set uh, represented from the East Coast to um, you know, places like uh, Venezuela, places like St. Kitts and uh, Puerto Rico and uh, those locations. And then in the East Tropical Pacific Ocean, uh, due in part to the, to the funding and the grant from the Guy Harvey Ocean Foundation, we start to see an increase in our recaptures come from, from there. So those are just some, some quick little highlights to um, you know, how our recapture data set breaks down. So this is a figure that uh, we submitted with that paper that's in review. Um, eager to hear back from uh, obviously those reviewers. Hopefully uh, we can get this all buttoned up soon. But this basically breaks down um, all the different movement types that are accompanied or shown in that table. Um, and we're gonna walk through a few of these. Um, so in terms of number of recaptures, uh, we have a lot of recaptures that have a short um, time at large or days at liberty, which is uh, given that we have a lot of in-state Florida movements, that, that's not shocking. Um, but um, nonetheless, we do have a peak here between uh, 200 and 300 days at liberty. That's indicative of those uh, East Coast international dispersals, uh, which is this pain here, I. And I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but um, hopefully you can. So Florida in-state movements, and Don Hammond took the approach of, uh, of uh, discussing the uh, movement rates by zone. So I'm gonna take that same approach here. Um, 306 movements logged, 25.62 um, miles per day um, is the average uh, movement per day, the movement rate from these straight line uh, recapture uh, arrows and or about 6.76 uh, days uh, within Florida state waters. Uh, the range, obviously we had a lot of recaptures uh, from the same day, um, but the range um, is up to 57 days uh, that we cate categorize as Florida in-state movements. To South Carolina, remarkably, we've only had 14 recoveries out of you know, 28,000 fish deployed um, along the um, U.S. East Coast uh, recovered in South Carolina. Um, so 
I'll, I'll refrain actually what I just said. So about 20,000 fish tagged off of Florida and we've had, you know, only 14 recovered off South Carolina. Um, but uh, the minimum amount of time between those locations was eight days with the maximum of 67 days, uh, about 25.15 days to move from um, from the f Straits of Florida to uh, the you know, South Carolina, Charleston area, or Georgia. Contrast this with movements to North Carolina, and we have 73 examples. So a uh, pretty big difference between 14 replicates and 73 replicates in terms of recapture, uh, recaptures between these uh, tagging zones. Um, the minimum between Florida and North Carolina, seven days, maximum 78, um, and a movement speed that is faster um, but it takes on average about 32.63 days um, to move from, uh, from Florida to uh, North Carolina. And then uh, Florida to Mid-Atlantic Bight, we have uh, you know, more examples than Florida to South Carolina and uh, a minimum 10 days to, get, to basically swim the entire East Coast, a maximum of 85 days. And the, uh, the average in terms of uh, days at large is 50.29 days. Um, so when you break these down, um, actually that's going to be in a couple slides, but when you break it down by um, all interstate movements, uh, it's uh, 35 days um, for fish to, to swim the entire um, east coast. And within South Carolina state waters, uh, movement rates are extremely slow, um, 3.92 miles per day or 19, um, 19 days uh, to uh, move within that state. Um, we've had 17 different examples and we've had some recaptures of fish within the same location uh, or virtually in the same location uh, after 76 days at large. Um, moving from South Carolina to North Carolina, minimum of three days between these states and 69 days um, between as, as the longest uh, days at large and about 15.29 days um, for fish to move between those locations. And then uh, very slow movement rates from uh, South Carolina to the Mid-Atlantic Bight uh, with only eight examples um, from there. But then, as I alluded to uh, moments ago, uh, the entire average looking at just all interstate movements is 35.18 days. Obviously, you could filter and look at this data in different ways, but uh, that's just taking the average of 169 um, movements along the East Coast. Now, when you look at just speed of travel for fish tagged off East Florida and recaptured out of state, which is 103 uh, different fish and the percent recaptured, uh, you kind of see a, a bimodal um, distribution beginning to, to, to appear with uh, kind of a, a peak of you know, 16 to 35 days at large um, to uh, 41 to 60 days. Um, so as we increase our amount of uh, recaptures generated, uh, it'll be interesting to see over time if this does become a more clear bimodal distribution. But then when you compare that to speed of travel for fish tagged you know, off South Carolina and recaptured out of state, uh, much more variability um, in terms of the percent recaptured by days at liberty. And I will mention this bin uh, on the extreme right side of the uh, x-axis uh, represents, you know, days at large greater than 81 days. So there's some you know, 100, 150 days at large um, within that, that bin. So um, much more variability, not as clear pattern um, for fish tagged um, and moved between states from South Carolina. Now, basically what I just provided was an update to uh, our approach to a paper we published in 2014. Um, movement rates we found using different statistical analyses were dependent upon region, uh, dependent upon latitude and distance from shore released. Uh, movements uh, from Florida to the South Atlantic Bight and to North Carolina had the highest observed rates, but those dispersals from South Carolina um, were you know, very slow. Uh, movements within the South Atlantic Bight slowest, but increased with distance from shore. So uh, Charleston Gyre and the Charleston Bump are obviously features there that uh, have an impact on dolphin movements and the movements of their bait. Um, so uh, that could be a, a strong factor in influencing those fish to, um, once they're within state waters in South Carolina, um, hang out, but um, obviously could also protract a potential season um, for, um, for fish if they don't arrive um, in, in that location. So another thing that we alluded to within this paper that is something that merits future investigation is that uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is a large weather teleconnection pattern uh, that influences the Gulf Stream 
So as we gather more data, it'd be interesting to compare uh, the NOA phase uh, to that of the Gulf Stream and our dolphin fish movements. Um, but you know, the gist here with this this uh, this bucket of research is within a management context, you know, these movement rates and pathways they really can be used to accurately assess the annual and seasonal variability uh, in timing of arrival, uh, the duration present of these stocks, and uh, and the departure of fish along the U.S. East Coast. Uh, so that um, was um, basically the main. Uh, tenants of this uh, publication and why I provided you that update for that section uh, here today. So, uh, and speaking to, um, you know, protracted seasons and changing and timing of arrival uh, of fish present along the East Coast, this is just a, a quick little column chart that I, I did um, looking at uh, all tag deployments by year and month from 2002 to 2020. So I did just a quick query to um, look at how these tag deployments break down by year and month. And uh, during the early part of the years, you can see these, uh, these two um, parts of the columns that are outlined with black borders. They represent May and June. You can see you know, May uh, and below that April, uh, constituting a larger proportion of our uh, tags deployed uh, early on in the program than later. Um, June kind of always uh, is, it more or less looks similar in terms of the amount of tags being deployed, but you could visually see that difference in the number of tags being deployed uh, by program participants um, during April, May, and the earlier um, months. And uh, while there's a lot of assumptions to assume here, we could have you know some taggers that were really active in early spring in these early years and not as active later. Um, but nonetheless, you know we've heard from participants that even though they're they're going out to tag and they're not finding fish early on, um, or they're they're not trying to tag and they're just not finding fish early on, uh, so we've heard you know a change in uh, kind of the arrival of fish along uh, the Keys, and we've also heard of protracted seasons off of South Carolina. Uh, so tag deployment data can be used to to start to investigate those types of trends. Um, in that same journal that we published that paper in 2014, um, Ed Farrell from Duke University um, worked with Don Hammond and they uh, used our data set in conjunction with uh, Pelagic Longline data to look at where recreational uh, anglers were tagging fish relative to uh, Pelagic Longline data and looking at you know, how the different sectors uh, in terms of attributes, oceanographic attributes, where these fish were being caught. Um, basically finding recreational catches occurred in you know, 19 degrees centigrade to 27 degrees centigrade. Um, long liners are zeroing in on a, a more um, narrow uh, temperature window. Um, but the majority of recreational dolphin fish were caught in association with sargassum um, and larger fish uh, are more frequently caught outside of floating mats. Um, and that's another thing that a lot of anglers have, have anecdotally, um, obviously, um, told us through the years that, that, that they're catching you know, bigger bulls away from um, floating mats and lots of smaller fish close to, to mats. So, uh, but the key thing I wanted to point out here with this paper is kind of the overlap of our data with uh, you know, U.S. commercial um, long line activity. Um, and uh, the seasons at which the overlap would occur the most, and uh, obviously spring in through June, um, when we're having the most amount of tags deployed, uh, that's when pelagic longliners are also um, setting the most amount of sets along the East Coast. Uh, so this paper kind of looked at using our data and looking at uh, pelagic longline data, how the two sectors overlapped, which uh, for this council I know is a, uh, a contentious topic um, that you guys are uh, working on, uh, working to address right now. So moving to Bahamas, so we've had um, quite a few movements from the um, U.S. East Coast to the Bahamas and the Bahamas to the U.S. East Coast. Um, so you know, we've had um, six deployments or, or six recoveries from the Florida Straits over to the Bahamas. The average days at large, 267 days. Uh, for Bahamas dispersals, 14.39 um, miles per day or 57 days uh, from 10 different um, recaptures. And then within the Bahamas, uh, 26 uh, different recoveries within those basins and very slow movement rates, uh, zero to 77 days at large. 
Um, once these fish get within the Exuma Sound or within the tongue of the ocean or Northwest Province Channel, uh, they are really sequestered to these large, um, you know, deep basins uh, surrounded by these shallow banks, and it induces them to kind of stay put. Um, and uh, they're, it's indicative in our tagging data how slow they move once they're uh, inside the Bahamas. But on the outside, you know, they move uh, relative, relatively speaking, similar to that from South Carolina uh, in terms of dispersal speeds. Now, we published a paper looking at the spatial differentiation of dolphinfish movements within the Bahamas back in 2014. And uh, this figure here really kind of just zeroes in on um, the fact that there were these AWTEC buoys off eastern uh, Andros, uh, East Andros Island, uh, where we had a lot of recaptures relative to those uh, essentially fish aggregating devices, uh, which were buoys deployed by the Navy. Um, and some of the recaptures are you know, up to 77 days near the same location. Um, for fish uh, tagged in that part of the tongue of the ocean. And then, you know, a natural kind of comparison uh, to do with fish tagging data is to compare it to, to surface drifters because, especially in the case of dolphin fish, their propensity to aggregate around floating objects is extremely high. Um, so it is a natural comparison to look at um, a data set that is fairly robust, um, collected by NOAA. Um, and uh, so these are just surface drifter tracks. Uh, around the uh, Atlantic Ocean, um, indicating different pathways that dolphin fish could take uh, to uh, return um, towards the East Coast and the Bahamas. And in many cases, the timing of these um, surface drifter tracks are similar to the timing of the recaptures that we're seeing, um, uh, which is why we, we really set off to do this type of analysis and continue to do it um, every day. So looking at these different panes, you, we, you know, in the upper left corner, uh, we have movements from the Gulf of Mexico into the Bahamas um, in 45 days. And we also had a satellite tag um, deployed in the Florida Straits end up in the Northwest Province Channel, showing that fish can enter the Bahamas through that passageway. Surface drifters have also entered in through there. Um, and the timing is similar when you look at the am amount of distance covered. Um, moving over to panel B, in the upper right, uh, we've had fish, you know, tagged off Miami and recaptured within Exuma Sound. Again, surface drifters making that uh, movement into that body of water within the Bahamas. Um, very, a lot of variability in terms of the days at large between those surface drifters, but um, nonetheless, it is a comparison to make. And uh, looking at panel C, the lower left, Big Pine Key to Long Island, Bahamas, 318 days. Uh, we had a, a surface drifter uh, make a similar movement in 357 days. Um, so, you know, the point here is that, you know, given their propensity to aggregate with floating logs or sargassum, uh, it, is a, it is a comparison that is deemed uh, reasonable to look at um, surface drifter tracks relative to dolphin fish movements. Um, and then, you know, the kind of the, the take home message with this paper Immigration occurred mostly, uh, most frequently for fish released north of Great Abaco and Eleuthera Islands. So uh, this basically suggests that, you know, if you, if you had conservation measurements set up for the Bahamas, you could apply it to different areas for the same stock, given the higher likelihood of entry for fish from the Antilles current into the U.S. East Coast system. So once fish are within the basins of the Bahamas, it's, it's the likelihood of, of getting out of those locations due to natural and fishing mortality is much lower uh, than you know, the dispersal possibility from you know, the Eastern Bohemian Escarpment. Uh, so so th this is an interesting situation um, given the, the geomorphology of the Bahamas in terms of, of a way to approach management within the Bahamas that you could set up uh, different locations to have different management measures. Say, um, you know, fish t uh, caught north of Great Abaco and Eleuthera could have a minimum size versus the ones that are within don't because they're more likely just to stay there. So you, you keep it for the, for the country. Um, so anyways, just, just uh, that was a thought that we, we uh, proposed um, relative to this research. And then, uh, you know, the observations from this paper, though, were key to understanding uh, international, regional, or interregional dolphin fish movements and stock structure uh, between the exclusive, exclusive economic zones in the Western Central Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea. And, you know, this, this research was published before 
uh, Don Hammond deployed a geolocating tag in June of 2014. Uh, so in that Bahamas paper, we proposed this, this circuit around the Western Central Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and then, you know, he deployed a, a, a geolocating satellite tag uh, made for microwave telemetry. And this is the, the reprojected path of the 43 inch bull, um, basically moving um, offshore in June and July. Uh, and then hanging, uh, you know, northeast of Bermuda during uh, August and October, or August and September, uh, and, you know, possibly indicative of areas of increased spawning activity, um, and then moving further offshore into the Central Atlantic Ocean um, during uh, September, October, uh, before heading down to the Caribbean Sea. And uh, this is the longest retention for a satellite tag on a dolphin uh, published uh, to date. 180 days that this fish uh, carried this tag. Uh, truly, uh, you know, a remarkable um, representation of, of technology to, to have a tag remain on a mid-trophic level species that obviously has extremely high predation rates, but also extremely high fishing and natural mortality rates. Um, so, uh, it, but a lot of information uh, came from this in terms of uh, comparing to previous analyses uh, and uh, our ongoing research. Um, so. Now, uh, through the years, when we start to look at the Caribbean Sea recaptures, that, uh, that geolocation track uh, obviously uh, is, uh, is strengthened when you have this recapture data set uh, in that we have you know, 19 different recoveries from uh, the East Coast off Charleston and off of the Eastern Florida Shelf uh, down to the Caribbean Sea in a very similar uh, time range. So that geolocation uh, track was 180 days. Uh, the range for movements within, um, for international dispersals is 159 to 557. Now, Captain Bouncer Smith is responsible for the tag uh, that was recovered after 557 days. And that is uh, to date our longest um, days at large that has been uh, confirmed. We did have a report of one fish that was at large for four years, but the reporter never um, got back to us. So we don't think that that was a, a valid um, a report. But nonetheless, Bouncer Smith is responsible for the uh, longest time at large uh, for the tagging program, which is pr truly remarkable. But um, 254 days is the average uh, time at liberty for fish tagged off the East Coast and making the movement down to the Caribbean Sea. And uh, that geolocation track, in addition to this uh, emigration uh, data into the Caribbean Sea was published in 2016, when we looked at the movement dynamics of dolphin fish in the Northeastern Caribbean Sea. Uh, and this really kind of uh, started to speak to the re-entry routes too, um, into the US Atlantic dolphin fish uh, fishery. So, also within that paper, we looked at fine scale movements with around Puerto Rico, showing that the Anagata Passage and the Mona Passage are uh, obviously influence um, the movements of fish here, but that the movement, uh, the Mona Passage can be a two-way street. We've had fish uh, tagged off St. John's end up in the Mona Passage, uh, fish tagged off of uh, you know, San Juan uh, with just north of Mona Island. Uh, so the Mona Passage truly is a, a two-way street for fish moving. Uh, either between the tropical Atlantic or the Caribbean Sea. And uh, the right pane here is just analysis of <clears throat> several, I think about 160 different surface drifters pointing to the high variability of, of movements of surface currents in the Mona Passage and the Anagata Passage. And then recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, one of Dr. Guy Harvey's fish uh, was recovered off of Key Largo, which is uh, another amazing uh, piece of the puzzle here. Um, and trying to devise the migration of this species. Uh, he tagged the fish on July 1st, it was 24 inches north of Grand Cayman, and it was recaptured 38 days later um, by Lazaro Rangel and his family off of Key Largo. Uh, so obviously fishery scientists, fishery managers, and, and fishermen had a, a solid hunch and obviously a, a, a intuition that fish are coming in through the loop current from the Caribbean Sea but we, have, we didn't have any hard evidence. And um, you know, this recapture gives us a, a timestamp on uh, the movement speeds between those locations. So just over a month for fish to move from Grand Cayman to um, Key Largo, and, uh, which is pretty remarkable. And 
Uh, obviously, the, the the step that we take is we then compare um, to surface drifters, and there was a drifter that drifted through the Western Caribbean Caribbean Sea uh, during June, July, and August, uh, same time window as this fish was at large. Uh, that surface drifter moved pretty rapidly. Um, 44 days. Uh, 44 uh, days was the um, average, or was the the amount of time it took to to make that movement. Um, and then we also looked at uh, just you know surface drifter tracks over the last uh, three summers, um, just pointing to that you know the tendency is to move west northwest towards the Yucatan Straits. Um, but this fits into kind of our broader portfolio of trying to describe uh, the movements of the species within the Caribbean Sea because the uh, connectivity to the U.S. Atlantic um, is extremely important. So this is a, a basin that we need to better understand uh, how the species uses um, the basin, how quickly it moves through it uh, to better understand fishery dynamics. So with that said, we had a satellite tag uh, uh, deployed on a fish last March, uh, not in 2020, but in 2019. And uh, th that, that tag surfaced uh, just north of the Columbia Panama gyre after 56 days. Uh, we've had several other satellite tags move in 30 days to you know, south of um, Dominican Republic. Uh, and uh, so this is that, that tag that popped off um, north of the Columbia Panama gyre um, in 2019. And it was tagged uh, aboard uh, Jesus Duran's uh, boat, Yadimar. He's actually a small scale uh, commercial fisherman. Um, so points to the fact that the Caribbean Sea, we have a lot of artisanal anglers that, that do help um, tag fish. It, that fish uh, traveled 920 days and, and 56 days, um, roughly about 16 miles per day. And then Julian Brossel has been responsible for tagging a lot of fish off of uh, Guadalupe as of late. And he tagged a 25 inch fish that was eaten by a very large bull. And then Edwin Felice of the Dominican Republic found that tag and the gut contents. Um, so obviously it's not a true um, recapture movement, but it still, uh, still puts a little um, movement rate data into the mix to kind of start to, to play with some numbers here to see how these fish are moving through the Caribbean Sea. So this brings us to um, the U.S. Atlantic dolphin supply routes. Now, Don Hammond presented this slide um, three years ago, and I figured I'd just update what he um, provided. So we have had a fish tagged by Matt Paramore uh, recaptured in the Bahamas. That fish moved um, between those locations, uh, an average of movement of 17.2 miles per day. Um, as, as the Bahamas segment uh, pointed out, um, you know, 14.39 miles per day is that movement route into the uh, U.S. Atlantic uh, fishery there. Obviously, the Northwest Providence Channel can also be an input. Um, you know, we've had eight different movements and recaptures generated along the uh, southern portion of the Greater Antilles and the northern portion of the Lesser Antilles showing 10 um, miles per day. And uh, north of the Greater Antilles, we have a, 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 sol a pretty solid data set starting to develop, 36 recoveries, um, 4.2 miles per day. So much slower movements um, there. And then um, given our three satellite tag, tag deployments in this part of the Caribbean Basin, we're starting to piece together a movement um, right there. And then Guy Harvey's fish recently just um, pointed out, uh, you know, a quantitative representation of how fish could come into the U.S. Atlantic fishery uh, via the loop current. Um, so obviously uh, this is a, uh, a figure that is not deemed publishable because our replicates are low, but this is the data that our program currently has in terms of how the species moves um, and enters the U.S. Atlantic dolphin fishery. So when you start to look at the exclusive economic zones um, with those same arrows, I mean, it's obviously apparent that this fish is traversing and, and transitory through all these different exclusive economic zones. Um, so this, uh, by nature of this, you, you kind of need to know, um, you know, who's landing it, who's targeting it, and, and what management conservation measurements are involved in those jurisdictions to better understand the health and the conservation potential for this, this stock. Um, so Robin Mahone uh, published a paper in 1999 looking at the landings of dolphin within the Caribbean Sea. Um, and uh, there are eight nations that provided uh, data to the FAO, highlighted here with red, um, and that's the figure of their landings. 
Um, so they kind of top out, you know, about 2,000 metric tons um, per year um, with a, you know, starting to rise towards 1995, towards 3,000 metric tons per year. And I figured I'd update this today, just to, it's an interesting analysis to start to look at. Um, but advancing the timeline out 23 years, you see an increase for these nations up through 95 to 2000. Some of the nations expand their dolphin fisheries, others um, don't. Um, and there's an overall um, kind of trend back to some of the earlier um, annual landings um, that they were recording for the FAO. Um, but you, you don't have the complete picture until you start to see um, what the other nations are contributing in terms of landing. So, um, there are many more nations that are starting to report um, landings as of late, and uh, obviously there's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the plot shows, shows this in terms of landings. So um, 6,000 metric tons was the highest in terms of um, landings uh, in 2013 um, between all the nations reporting to the FAO. And the yellow um, uh, EZs here are indicative of those other nations that are beginning to report um, their landings to FAO. Um, which is a, a good thing to do, obviously, so that we have some sort of baseline on how the species is being targeted uh, commercially. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty still regarding um, whether the landings reported are accurate um, for these different um, locations. And then these 16 nations um, don't have a record um, of dolphin landings uh, recorded in the FAO, uh, which is unfortunate because that is a piece um, of data that would be very valuable for better understanding uh, annual uh, landings for these nations. And then within, um, you know, zone 31, which I highlighted here by these uh, polygons, um, kind of a, it's a, a blue tint. Um, zone 31 is the zone for which, for which most of these EEZs belong. Uh, zone 41 is to the south, and that's where Brazil is targeting um, dolphin in this location. Um, but, you know, the point here I, I just want to make is that you have an unknown level of misreporting for nations that, that do report landings, and then also have an unknown level of dolphin bycatch and in major international fishing operations in Zone 31. So there's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, who's targeting it, how much is being landed per year, uh, which obviously leads to lots of thoughts about um, the status of the stock. And then there are scientists that have published data showing that dolphin fish is indeed uh, highly landed in, uh, as an indirect uh, landed species in, uh, say, swordfish and yellowfin and uh, yellowfin tuna and big eye tuna uh, fisheries. Uh, dolphin fish is actually landed higher um, in the pelagic longline fishery than, say, big eye tuna. Um, and then there was a paper just published this past year or within this year um, from Frere et al., uh, a colleague of Daniel Pauly that estimated the global catches of marine recreational fisheries. And in this paper, they, they point out a, an increase in recreational catch for uh, Coryphanidae, which is the family of um, the common dolphin fish uh, through the you know, past uh, 30 years. You've seen an increase in the amount of dolphin fish being caught recreationally. So, so these are clear indications that there are, you know, obviously some issues and threats surrounding this stock um, in our current uh, year and in, in, in our reality. So uh, we've come to kind of the back half part of the talk. The next few segments um, kind of really zero in on the end of this, uh, this talk. Just want to point out to we have a lot of uncertainty with, uh, with landings. We have a lot of uncertainty with indirect landings. Um, and also we have a lot of uncertainty of uh, fish being uh, captured at fads and, and the performance of fads and how anglers are using fads. So one of the five components of our fad research is to institute a volunteer vessel tracking program. And uh, this has been ongoing since 2017. And we've collected uh, a lot of vessel tracks from charter, commercial, and recreational anglers around Puerto Rico, as well as their daily trip composition, um, just to look at, um, to try to approximate fad performance of catch at fads and, and catch away from fads. Um, and we started to, to get some baseline uh, catch and effort results um, from this analysis. Uh, obviously, it points to, uh, to hot spots that anglers are, are fishing. Um, and uh, you start to look at 
where locations fishermen are are fishing. Um, also look at you know where they're fishing relative to fads, which are these ovals off of the north coast of Puerto Rico. But then when you when you aggregate um, the catch based on species, uh, you see that you know with, around Puerto Rico these boats the majority are catching dolphin fish. Um, uh, Sixty percent of the catch logged uh, is dolphin fish, followed by blackfin tuna and wahoo. And so, you know, this is a, a small sample size in terms of the number of boats we're tracking over the last uh, several years. I'd say about 40 different boats we've been involved with, um, but maybe about 13 of those have been consistent. So imagine scaling that up to um, research outside of just Puerto Rico and looking at other islands. And I mean, there's just a lot of data that doesn't exist regarding landings and effort for, for this, uh, this species. And then another component, obviously, is to look at um, recaptures of dolphin fish at FADS. So we've had several recaptures at FADS on the north coast and at FADS uh, off of uh, the north drop or near the north drop off the Virgin Islands. Um, so we're starting to, to look at um, both, you know, fishery dependent, um, you know, sources of data at FADS, but also um, fishery independent uh, sources of data, um, although, this was a, uh, a satellite tag that truly, you know, satellite tags are fishery independent sources of data because the tags pop off the fish um, when the, uh, either the fish dies or the, the monitoring period ends. But in the case of this particular fish, it was recaptured by an angler at a fad off the south coast of Dominican Republic. And this is just raw data um, from this geolocation track and I felt comfortable showing you the raw data because we do know the recapture site. So um, the red dot is where the fish was recaptured, the green dots where we deployed it, um, and this is the depth um, profile over that time series. So, you know, it's 56 days between the south coast of Puerto Rico and um, the uh, area off of Casa de Campo, um, which is a very short distance for 56 days. Uh, so we, we, we are obviously going to be deploying more satellite tags off the south coast. So it'll be interesting to see if, if we have more recoveries at FADS um, off the southern coast of Dominican Republic. So vertical movements. We published a paper in 2014 uh, kind of looking at uh, the overall vertical movement strategy of adult male dolphin fish. Um, six fish we analyzed in this paper. Uh, maximum depth recorded was 255 meters. Um, by and large, the key thing I want to point out here is that, you know, adult male dolphin fish uh, exhibit a, a, a diagonal vertical movement strategy of diving deeper, more complex, deep um, dives uh, at nighttime. Um, they're at depth for longer at nighttime than during day. And uh, this is actually eight different histograms um, of, of tags that we've collected. And then these two bottom ones are five tags in each plot each. Uh, between males and females. Um, so there could be differences between sex for vertical movements, which would be uh, an interesting uh, thing to publish, uh, but we, we still haven't taken this manuscript to that point. But nonetheless, we are compiling data on looking at differences in, in vertical movement strategy by sex. So given that we're almost here at the end, um, you know, growth, we have obviously mark and recapture data with growth estimates. So this data set can be applied to looking at growth based on tagging data. Um, our um, estimate that we estimated a few years ago is 2.14 um, millimeters per day, which is about 0 0.08 inches per day, which equates to about half an inch per week, um, which is the median value when you compare to these other studies conducted with otoliths and with scales. Um, so an interesting look um, potentially as we move down the road, um, looking at growth through tagging data. And then the last big section here is population structure. In 2016, we published a paper, collected 306 samples around the Western Central Atlantic. Um, we compared the ND1 gene um, basically between uh, the hotspot sampling region was San Juan and La Parguera. We also collected samples on subsequent days to kind of look at the different runs of fish around the island and see if they represented different stocks. And we found low genetic differentiation between these, uh, these sample sizes. Um, over this time period. And uh, when you look um, out throughout the entire sampling region, we only found very low um, genetic differentiation, but not indicative of, you know, different genetic stocks, but 
uh, there could be potentially different fishery stocks in terms of um, where these fish are moving relative to um, locations in the Western Central Atlantic Ocean, which there's an ongoing debate um, since the mid 80s um, about whether there are two different uh, migration routes within the uh, Atlantic um, for dolphin fish, which still remains to be uh, examined and uh, quantified. So we've reached the conclusion. So we do have some data pointing to shortened seasons and different uh, changes in size frequency for fish um, caught and targeted um, by our um, tagging teams for our program. Um, Overall, there's an issue of the quality of data on recreational fishery. You know, we don't have that much data on recreational on this recreational fishery yet. There's been an increase in the fishery substantially over the past 30 years. Um, there's also, you know, issues of indirect harvest in per se and longline fisheries. Um, there's published sources um, citing that, and uh, you know, we have inconsistent regulations uh, on the same stock despite transitory evidence. That's that's an issue facing the WCA stock. And lack of data on FADs or at FADs in the Caribbean Sea, um, which is something that uh, needs to be improved as we move. Um, a few years ago, there was a paper published about increasing demand uh, of dolphin fish in major seafood markets. So people do like to eat um, dolphin fish. So um, there's been an increase in demand documented um, in terms of seafood markets. Now, uh, Ruder Schausen et al. published a paper um, a couple of years ago, or uh, last year actually, using uh, a portion of our data set uh, and, and found high discord mortality uh, within the recreational hook and line fishery along the East Coast, uh, which does point to the fact that we have to educate anglers better about the use of different types of gears um, in terms of using circle hooks um, to help uh, you know, reduce the amount of fish that die if they shake off or if they're released uh, under the minimum size. Um, so really fascinating uh, model that uh, Ruder Schausen et al. Um, constructed to publish um, that uh, paper. Now there's also this perception uh, of the resistance uh, that this fish is basically resistant to overfishing and, and that's, that's a poor perception to take um, with this uh, dolphin fish species and um, you know so that's a, a social perception that I have come across repeatedly regarding um, this species. And then lastly, underappreciation of the multinational distribution, uh, which basically that, that fragments data collection and management. Uh, so we need to increase data collection across zones, across EEZs, uh, with hopes to increase you know, better management within those same zones. And, and that is what I work towards day in and day out, um, to try to you know, obviously bring back size and abundance um, for um, fish uh, stocks within the ocean, and in particular, um, trying to protect the, the species uh, as we move forward. Um, so with that said, that, that concludes um, my talk here today. Um, I think we have some times for questions. Uh, any, uh, John, would you like to, to chime in here? Sure. Um, yeah, thank you for that presentation. That uh, was quite the, the wide range of, of topics. So certainly appreciate that. Um, incredibly informative. But um, so with that, we'll, we'll jump over to the question and answer session. Um, for those of you that um, are familiar with this, we'll be uh, we'll we'll be um, calling on people that have raised their hand digitally. And if you look at the near the very top, there's a little hand icon that you can click on to raise your hand. Um, and we'll start off with uh, council members, followed by uh, AP and SSC members. And if there's time, we'll we'll try to get around to all questions from everyone. But we'll we'll see where that we end up. But with that, um, if there are any questions, um, uh, please raise your hand and I'll call on you. And also mention there is a question box um, and feel free to type your questions in there and we'll, we'll try to get to them as time allows. And so with that, uh, Richard Harrison, um, I, I see that, that your hand is up. I will unmute you here momentarily. All right, you're unmuted. Uh, Richard Harris, I'm on the um, advisory panel for the Dolphin Wahoo representing, uh, well, I'm out of Oregon Inlet, North Carolina, I'm a charter boat captain. 
I took the day off just to enjoy this uh, session. Um, one of the things I've noticed and I want to present this to, to you so that when we have the council meeting in September, it can be thought about. And I might have spoken with someone about this in an email with, with, uh, with you. Um, we have noticed over the last five years that our spring fishery has, has I don't want to say suffered, but has dropped off. And a lot of it's got to do with the lack of sargasm that's, that's in the area and uh, not the number of juvenile fish that we've been seeing in the past. But as you roll around to this time of year, in, in the last two weeks, again, uh, even when we found them, the fish were way offshore, way further than they've ever been. Uh, and we're hearing from our longline friends that these fish are on the other side of the stream. They don't target the juvenile fish. They, they mainly are interested in the larger fish, but they have moved more to the eastern. Even if you have the uh, tide line, you find them not so much in along the edge of the continental shelf, but 10 to 20 miles offshore of where we normally find them. And then about this time of year, there hasn't been any in the northeast quadrant where we are marlin fishing now. We've, our marlin fishing picks up this time of year and we're marlin fishing. And the last few years we have seen large numbers, even though you don't have any, usually have any tide lines or grass line sargasm up there, any kind of float will be holding, you know, 300 dolphin, one to 300 dolphin around it. And there are a larger class of juveniles. There'll be a very nice, uh, you know, to where we don't even catch a limit of them because they're so nice. We don't, you don't need a limit of them, but it's just saying, what have y'all seen in the way that the migration pattern has changed? Are these fish coming up the other side? Cause it seems like Hatteras has no juveniles and yet we're getting them now where these fish and I, they're not migrating from, uh, from North, they're coming from the East. Are y'all seeing any uh, indication from your studies of these fish bypassing you know, these inside talents crossing the stream further out and reaching the uh, the west side of the stream from a, a, a further further out. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard Harrison, for that question and, and sharing those observations. Um, unfortunately, the answer is, is we really don't have data that's clearly showing um, anything indicative of, of what you're describing. Um, we're dependent, obviously, on, on anglers tagging fish um, in different locations uh, south of the Outer Banks. And if, if we don't have, uh, you know, fish being de deployed on the eastern side of the Gulf Stream, we subsequently won't ever potentially have any recoveries uh, off that part of the Gulf Stream to, to look at, um, you know, how uh, the, the, the fish are moving between those locations. So, Unfortunately, the short answer um, is, is no. Um, we don't have uh, those data within the conventional market recapture data set. Um, but we, we have heard anecdotal reports from other anglers um, that have voiced similar issues that you're sharing um, uh, with me. Um, so, you know, this does point to the fact that, you know, we have um, oceanographic uh, processes that these dolphin are influenced by. Um, so we have a solid data set that does merit future investigation relative to how the Gulf Stream moves um, during uh, the past, uh, you know, 19 years, uh, but we haven't delved into that exact analysis. So unfortunately, I can't point to any particular part of our data set that is, is showing um, anything indicative of what you're describing. All right. Um, thank you. Next up, I see uh, Chester Brewer. You have your hand up. I'll unmute you. All right. Should be good to go. Okay. Can you hear me? We can. Yep. Right. Right. Um, I've been contacted recently by a number of guides in South Florida and down in the Keys, and they are very concerned with the fact that they're not seeing what they refer to as slammers. Uh, that's big dolphin. And obviously their clientele signs on this time of year 
to go out and catch big dolphin. They're not paying to go out and catch schoolies. So they feel like it's been hurting their business. And a number of them have gotten, I mean, they're, they're people that are start, starting to organize. And there's a lot of upset about it. In looking at your charts, which thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for, for this work. It appears that one of the major migration routes out of Florida is up towards North Carolina, maybe a little bit beyond. And then these fish seem to, from that area, that they seem to be going out to sea. You made reference to them kind of hanging out on, up above Bermuda. And then perhaps, and this is this is my question, is there good evidence to show that those fish are then coming back down south and going into the Caribbean Sea? And is there, it probably isn't. I mean, dolphin are spawning all the time. So, but I mean, is there any evidence to show that these fish are spawning up there above Bermuda and then perhaps again in the Caribbean Sea or what's going on there? Because we've got, like, we got a real problem. We really do uh, in South Florida and the Keys. And I'd like to, to be able to, for us to be able to put our hands on it and, and, and have a better understanding of what the problem is. And I'll mute myself. Thank you, sir. Well, thanks, Chester uh, Brewer, for that uh, that question. And uh, this is something that we've repeatedly heard from a lot of our tagging teams and uh, even just fishermen that don't participate, but provide us, uh, you know, insight. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I am concerned about this very topic as well. Um, so to address your question, uh, we have seen, you know, two point, you know, about 2.69% of our data set is from the East Coast uh, dispersing from either the Straits uh, or uh, Charleston, South Carolina down to the Caribbean Sea. Uh, average days at large are 254 days. So we have data showing that this species is making those movements down the Caribbean Sea. And, uh, you know, we've, we also have subsequently uh, data connecting the U.S. Caribbean Sea and other parts of the Caribbean Sea with um, the East Coast. So we have an idea that they're making this circuit and we know kind of time scales and spatial scales that they're potentially making the circuit on. Um, so the, uh, to address your question, it really comes to the fact that we don't know uh, exactly how much they're being landed in the Caribbean Sea, by which island nations is taking um, the most, and how could that could potentially play into influencing a decrease in young of the year fish and larger fish um, in the Straits of Florida. So uh, I fish repeatedly um, over the past three years, I've fished a lot out of Kudjo, and you know we fish uh, a week at a time and uh, I, I have never really come across a large slammer dolphin uh, like I do pretty much every outing when I embark uh, out of Puerto Rico. Um, so uh, there are interesting facets of this fishery in terms of uh, size frequency between the zones that we tag in uh, with the Florida Straits being the smallest individuals. Um, and I'll just point out um, the fact that um, as of late, we have, um, you know, off of the Mid-Atlantic Bite, the last uh, two years or last year, we've had 74 pound fish caught in a poor man's canyon uh, off of uh, Maryland and off of Delaware. And we have not seen that type of um, behavior, that type of size frequency appear uh, in the Keys. So, so the question is how and why uh, are we seeing these 74.5-pound uh, fish, 72.8-pound fish caught last year in Poor Man's, and then this fish caught last week or two weeks ago in the White Marlin Open uh, in this location while down in the Florida Keys. The biggest bull that I've seen lately is, you know, a 39-pound bull that people freaked out about on social media. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing patterns and in, in size, frequency, uh, distribution between our tagging zones. Um, there's a lot of unknowns about what is describing that. Uh, but I think, you know, one place to uh, examine 
uh, are the landings data in the Caribbean Sea and uh, what are we missing there in terms of misreportings and underreportings uh, for this uh, dolphinfish stock? All right, thank you. We have a, a question that was typed into the question box from Su Susanna Music. Um, what type of tag do you use? Well, there's multiple different types of tags. For the conventional tags, we're using just a plastic dart tag, uh, which that's what we distribute to um, all of our taggers, but we use different types of electronic tags and satellite tags. Uh, it depends on the study uh, question. Um, geolocating satellite tags for looking at migratory work, um, high rate vertical movement tags for looking at high rate, you know, vertical movement, and then acoustic tags for fad work. So it really depends on a study objective. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Dewey Himmelright. I see you have your hand up. I'll unmute you. I think at this point you're self-muted. About now, can you hear me? Yep, can hear you. Yep. yep. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, it's as it continues to get more informative with this dolphin research. I clearly think that the name of the entity that y'all have changed your name to, Beyond Our Shores, is more than appropriate. Particular for dolphin, uh, the dolphin fishery. Um, it's a lot here to consume in an hour and a half, and also to speak on it or to ask questions on it. But until we know what the harvest is of all countries, it's really hard to manage a fishery in the U.S. I, I look at this similar to the Gulf of Guinea pursane fisheries for tunas and what the effect of that has on us fishing here in the US. But I want to applaud you for your research um, and, and it's a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, I like it a lot, thank you. Well, thank you, Dewey, for those that, that pointing out those uh, those accolades. Thank you very much for that, and also pointing out the Gulf of Guinea. Um, you know, uh, I, I completely agree with you that some of the baseline data that we need is harvest. Um, looking globally, uh, kind of the big five nations that that are responsible for global production of dolphin catch are you know Peru, Japan, Taiwan, China, Ecuador. Um, massive commercial fisheries that target. Um, these uh, stocks in the Eastern Pacific Ocean and uh, in the Western Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, I'll go back to the slide where we have data deficiency for these nations. I mean, the Bahamas, uh, you know, they might submit data to the Caribbean Regional Fishery Mechanism, CARICOM or OSPESCA, but, you know, without having that data also be housed in FAO, um, you wonder about the validity of the data. Um, so, uh, you know, the Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas to me is, is a location where we just, we need harvest data from those island nations. And if anyone on the council knows where those data, data sources are, um, I would love to obviously um, talk with them. Um, but we also have an unknown level of misreporting for nations too. There's a lot of the FAO data that the numbers will have this F next to it, uh, which basically mean that there's uncertainty about that value. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I started this talk with our research objectives and how there's just a high level of data deficiencies for multiple different objectives. And it's, it's, it's tough to see that given that we have a 19 year history um, and how hard that I personally work to try to increase data collection um, within our tagging program. But we are making great strides um, in certain aspects of our research. So. Um, I do have hope that we could better understand this stock because for many people, um, it is uh, their livelihoods and their, their lifestyle um, that depend on for this, this particular species. All right, Chester, I see that you still have your hand up. I'm not sure if that if you had another question or if I forgot to put it down there, but I just thought I'd follow up with that. Can you hear me? Yes. 
I, I had a, a, a follow up because I think okay. that um, my prior question, I, I may not have phrased it very well. The, the fish that come off of North Carolina and go hang out there sort of like above Bermuda, um, it looks like from the presentation that those fish do come back into the Caribbean Sea. But I, I didn't see any definite tracks of that. So my question is, is there hard information that those fish that go hang out there above Bermuda, as, as it was described, do eventually come back down, uh, if they're not caught or killed, come back down to the Caribbean Sea? Thank you. Uh, yes, I, that was a two-part question that you asked, and I'm sorry that I forgot about the um, the the U.S. East Coast revisits is what we call um, those movements. So we have not had a geolocation track show a uh, a removement back into um, the U.S. Uh, exclusive economic zone, but we have you know several dozen recoveries for fish tagged off Florida and tagged in the Mid Atlantic Bite or the South Atlantic Bite that have moved back into um, the U.S. East Coast system, um, showing substantial growth over those time periods. Um, I'm going to try to do something here on the fly of looking at um, one of our web pages uh, that points to this data because I didn't include it in this um, um, talk, but I have it on this web page, um, and it's on our DolphinTagging.com general movements patterns. And I just pulled that up, so let me just uh, zoom on down there. Um, so we've got right here. Let me see if you get, I don't know if you guys can see this web page now. Can you see it? We can, yes. Okay, so US East Coast return migrants. Um, so this is analysis that we did um, a couple years ago um, regarding our US East Coast return migrants. Um, but spring is a time of these U.S. East Coast return migrants, and we see uh, a larger proportion of fish recaptured within the system um, for a fish tagged in one year, um, say, you know, in 2020, and recaptured in 2021 in the spring. And the majority of those fish are recaptured in the South Atlantic Bight um, and off North Carolina. Um, so uh, we have, you know, these are obviously people involved in these recoveries. But when you scan down this page, um, these are examples. And uh, so these would be the um, tagging locations. So this is the July release sites. And these are the um, recapture months. So we have uh, November, we have uh, February, and we have May. Um, and we have the days at large for these recaptures. And we have the growth. Um, so you can see small fish being tagged um, off Kudjo, off of Marathon. Um, and being recaptured 126, 124, 205, 325 days later um, with, you know, hefty growths in terms of 15 inches to 25 inches. Uh, that's just within the keys. Um, then when you move up to South Florida return migrants, tagged off Miami, you know, Thomas Flyer, um, Captain Jimbo Thomas, Rick Thomas, they're a big charter that tag. Um, some of these recoveries are from them. Um, but you have, you know, 371 days, 15 inches of growth. Uh, growth was not associated with this one, unfortunately, but, um, you know, 24 inches of growth for this fish in 275 days. Um, and then when you move up to Georgia, um, we also have a couple examples. Um, fish tagged off of the Keys, recaptured off Cuba, recaptured, uh, you know, off of an Exuma Sound. Um, and substantial growth there. So I think this is pointing to what Chester is alluding to, that we do have, you know, conventional recapture data showing this return migration tendency um, for these fish uh, along the East Coast. And all these data are published on the uh, dolphintagging.com, uh, U.S. East Coast return migrants, and we published this in a newsletter a while ago. Um, but yeah, you know, in putting together today's talk, there's there's so much I can include and so much that I want to, but I can't. Um, here's a big one. This is a fish tagged in June in recoveries. So we could have a whole analysis of just this um, today, uh, but I'll just leave it at that. Does that answer your question, Chester? It does, thank you very much.
All right, I have one more quick follow-up question um, from Dewey, and it was that the landings charts that you were showing, I think on slide 59, were those uh, commercial, recreational, or both, um, as far as landings in the um, Caribbean? Yeah, so these are commercial uh, landings reported to uh, FAO. And uh, this is an analysis that I'm trying to update. It's, it's basically updating Robin Mahone's work and that, she, that he published in 1999. Um, and he basically characterized um, Caribbean fisheries. And it's something that I think that needs to be updated. So I've been working towards that. Um, but one of the principal figures that he published was looking at uh, these you know, major eight nations and their commercial landings. And then um, what we would put in the new paper would be obviously the other nations. Also Brazil um, is a big player um, in uh, you know, commercial landings within zones 41. So I, I think it's necessary to revisit this work. So I've been uh, having discussions with different fishery scientists in Barbados and uh, Venezuela to, to gather input. Um, but we don't know how many artisanal anglers exist within the Caribbean Sea and targeting um, dolphin. We don't know what type of gears. Are, are they using shallow set long line, deep set long line, just hook and line, hand line? Um, so characterizing the fishery to me is a very important step uh, that needs to be done. Um, I will mention that I do have a pretty full plate in terms of I'm, I'm my only staff here at the Dolphin Fish Research Program. Um, so I, I, you know, I juggle a lot of different uh, papers and working towards papers. Um, so, but I did do this analysis for today. Uh, so thanks for that question relative to that. All right, well, thanks very much. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions? Um, and I know we've kind of run a little bit past our time here. Um, but, oh, uh, I, I have a question from uh, Beverly Sauls. Will, th will that information be publicly available? Yeah, and so one of my drives is to publish peer-reviewed work and like I alluded to at the beginning, this uh, the first part of this talk um, basically was taken from that paper. Um, as soon as we get reviews and we work towards publishing that, um, the idea is to publish um, you know, the data set, the Dolphin Fish Research Program data set um, for um, stakeholders and anglers to examine and to, uh, to play with and do research projects on or whatever. But until we have, uh, you know, reviews and, and, and how we should approach doing that, um, we haven't uh, published um, all of the ins and outs of the data um, collected. So, but it is a goal. I just want to do it correctly. So I'm not um, trying to rush to do that. All right. Um, well, Seeing no further questions, um, and there again, kind of running over our time a little bit. Thank you very much. That was, um, I, I mean, that was an incredible presentation. It really was. And, uh, you know, I, I know I, I appreciate it. I know on behalf of the council, um, certainly thank you for, for all the, the effort and time that you put in to put this together. And I know that um, we, we all got quite a bit out of it on a species that is quite loved, um, but the, you know, the, there's still many data gaps on what what um, goes on with the species in the in the fishery, um, you know, on the international level. So thank you very much. And thank you, John, and thank you uh, all the attendees and the council. It truly was a pleasure to present today and and let me know um, you know what we can do for uh, the September meeting. Okay, and I'll be in touch shortly. All right, thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone.